welcome everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here to the third Wilhelm Wundt Dialogue. My name is Christina Musold. I'm one of the co-directors of the Leipzig Research Center for Early Child Development, which is hosting this dialogue. Um, as I said, this is the third dialogue in this series. The idea of these dialogues is to promote scientific progress in the field of developmental science through a constructive, critical discussion between uh, two prominent researchers in the field. Um, so, two renowned scientists with opposing or maybe converging, as we'll see uh, how the debate develops today, views uh, on a central topic in child development are uh, invited to discuss first amongst themselves and then of course with you here as well. So it's my great pleasure today to welcome Caroline Rowland, who is uh, director of the language development department at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in Nijmegen and is also professor of first language acquisition at Radboud University and professor of developmental psychology at the U University of Liverpool uh, and a co-director of an international center for language and communicative development. Um, as you might have guessed from the title of today's dialogue, her research focuses on how children learn to communicate with language and how the developing brain supports this process. Um, she's also interested in how this is affected by cross-linguistic, cultural and individual variation and investigates these questions by means of multiple methods. She'll be discussing today with Michael Frank, uh, whom you might already know from his keynote at the Pepsi earlier this week. He is um, Professor of Human Biology and Director of, of the Symbolic Systems Program at Stanford University um, and studies children's language learning and how it interacts with their developing understanding of the social world. He's particularly interested in bringing larger data sets to bear on these questions and also uses a variety of methods to investigate language acquisition. Um, these two researchers will be um, giving kind of a brief summary of their views uh, on this topic, on the puzzle of language acquisition, first independently of each other, and then they will uh, have a discussion, which is going to be moderated by Manuel Bohn, who is um, a postdoc here at the Leipzig Research Center for Early Child Development. He's a developmental psychologist, also interested in the psychological foundations of human communication. Um, and his current research focuses on how children use and understand words and gestures in context. So he's also um, an expert in this area and an excellent person to moderate this debate. Um, so as I said, um, there'll be a discussion uh, between the panel first, then we'll open up the discussion. And uh, after the dialogue and the discussion, you are all warmly invited to, to a reception, which will take place um, just upstairs when you get out of, uh, leave the lecture hall, take the stairs to your right, there'll be uh, cake and coffee and other drinks um, and we can continue the discussion there. I should also point out um, that this lecture will be recorded, so you should just be aware of that um, in case you don't want to be recorded. Um, I guess you'll have to save your questions for the reception. Okay, so with that, um, I'll hand over to Manuel and look forward to today's dialogue. Okay, uh, thank you, Christina, for the introduction. Um, as a child language researcher myself, I'm really excited about the, the upcoming dialogue, and in my opinion, there could, could have hardly been a better choice of discussions here. Um, so in the next couple of minutes, I will try to give you a little overview of the, the topic on the discussion, um, language acquisition, but mostly I'll be raising questions, and um, hopefully these questions will get you interested and excited about the topic as well. So I thought, how to better start this introduction than with the person that this dialogue is named after, Wilhelm Wundt. As many of you know, um, 140 years ago, in 1879, Wilhelm Wundt founded the first laboratory for psychological research in the world here in Leipzig. Um, and in his quest to understand the human mind, he saw language as the key to understanding human psychology. Let me give you a quote. Uh, I'll start with the German version. Gerade hier auf dem Gebiet der Sprache liegt aber der Schatz verborgen, der gehoben werden muss, wenn wir in den Besitz einer wahren psychologischen Entwicklungsgeschichte der zusammengesetzten Formen des Denkens gelangen sollen. The rough English translation would be, it is in the domain of language that the treasure is hidden which is to be unearthed 
if we want to acquire a true psychological developmental history of the more complex processes of thought. Now, if language is key to the human mind, then language acquisition is key to understanding how the mind develops. And aside of these kind of scientific considerations, also language is so central to human life from a very practical point of view. So it's the medium of choice for communication, most of our daily social interactions. Um, and it's also relevant from many other perspectives. So for example, early language abilities are a very good predictor of academic achievement and socioeconomic status. And language skills are also related to psychological health and well-being. So it seems that successfully learning language seems to be an important step in becoming a healthy, becoming and being a healthy and functioning member of society. And this, of course, raises the question, how do children learn language? So there are roughly two answers, or broadly two answers to this question. The first is more descriptive and lists kind of the succession of stages and phases that children go through during their language development. So here's a brief um, um, version of this. Children start to connect or associate words with objects in the middle of their first year of life. They engage in rich nonverbal um, communicative interactions um, uh, in the later part of their first year of life. Then the first words start to appear around one year. And then in the second year of life, there's a steady increase in the vocabulary. And towards the, the end of the second year of life, children start to combine words for the first time. And then throughout the preschool years, there's an explosion in the vocabulary and even longer combinations um, that children produce. Now, however, as we will see, um, this is a very limited and overly simplified of picture of language acquisition that I just gave you. And in reality, there's a lot of variation in terms of when children reach these stages and phases and how fast they progress through them. And to complicate the picture even more, this timeline is largely based on research with children acquiring English or other Western languages. Um, and in some linguistic contexts, some of these stages or phases are not clearly identifiable. So, this, and um, the setting in which children learn language, uh, the ch settings in which children learn language are also um, highly variable and, and differ both within a, cult, uh, a given culture and also between cultures. Yet at some point, all typically developing children will master the native language. Um, and furthermore, there are even some, many world regions where children grow up not just to learn langu one language, but actually multiple languages. So what, what I take from this, and hopefully you too, is that there seem to be many different paths towards language. And this brings us to the second question, or the second answer to the question of how children learn language. And the second, second answer is more concerned with the psychological processes that enable children to learn language. So what are these processes? Um, or, and, and here's just to illustrate um, some of the tasks that children have to learn. So first of all, so how do children learn um, that words have meanings? How do children learn um, what the meanings of individual words are? How do they learn how to say them? And, uh, or how do they learn how to combine them into larger combinations or sentences? And a, sec a satisfactory answer to these questions um, has to do justice, of course, to the variation that I pointed out before. So there are many different ways in which children um, learn language, and so there have, but there have to be, has to be an answer to, uh, like a, a unified answer to how these processes enable this variation. So I hope uh, by now that you agree that language acquisition is a fascinating, um, complex, and also multifaceted process. Um, and this, compl this complexity is mirrored by some seemingly contradictory features of language itself. Let me give you two pairs of these features um, and the questions they raise. And this will also foreshadow to some extent um, some of the discussions point that we will we'll touch upon later. So the first one is that language is rare, yet language is everywhere. So language is rare in the sense that um, so far we haven't discovered a uh, any communicative system in any other animal species that resembles language in its complexity and productivity. And all attempts to teach language to um, other animals have essentially failed. So what prevents other animals from creating um, or inventing language? Yet language is everywhere. All human societies have language. So wh why is language so important for, for humans in their, um, in their social life? Um, and because, of, because, of the, because language is omnipresent, have humans evolved certain psychological abilities that are specific to language that allow uh, humans to invent language and also to uh, children to learn language? Um, the other points are that language is resilient, yet language is fragile. 
So language is resilient in the sense that children learn whatever language they grow up in, whether, whether or not it's the, the language of their genetic parents or not, whatever linguistic environment they're immersed in, that's the language that they learn. And even, to, uh, even beyond that, deaf children who grow up with hearing parents, so they, they don't have a language model that they grow up with, when they're put together in communities, they create their own languages, pass that on over generations, and establish a new language, so to say. Um, so what do all of these languages have in common, and what allows children to create them and also to learn them all? On the other hand, language is fragile. Um, there's a huge variability in actual language skills if you look at the language skills um, within a given population. And under some clinical conditions, social or genetic in nature, children do not learn language at all. So the question is, what, do, what, kind of, what critical components have to be in place so that, all, so that children are able to learn language? So to conclude, what we have seen um, is that some aspects of language uh, acquisition are very similar for all children, yet others are very different between them. And so for tonight, we will call this, the, this pattern the puzzle of language acquisition. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward, to, uh, uh, forward to, to hearing from our discussants, and hopefully they will put, put the pieces together um, in order to maybe solve the puzzle. So what will happen next is that we will hear the two individual talks, um, first from Mike Frank and then from Caroline Rowland. Um, after the individual statements, there will be a 30-minute discussion um, moderated by me, and then we will have questions from the public. And with this, I hand over to Mike Frank. Thank you very much, Manuel. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, and I love that this is a dialogue rather than a debate. It's, it provides a really nice opportunity to engage on some of these bigger issues that inspired me to be in the field and to get a chance to exchange ideas with uh, Professor Rowland, whose work I have admired for a while, but uh, who I met first in person today. So, uh, As Manuel said so nicely, the puzzle of language acquisition is how children learn. But I want to start actually by why they learn. And my thesis is that that why is very simple. It is obvious. It's that kids want to communicate with other people. So in one sense, of course, you don't need a scientist to say this. You can ask any parent. But the motivation uh, for language learning to communicate has much greater consequences for how children learn than has been previously discussed. And it's those consequences that I want to bring out. So I'll have three points. Um, that the drive to communicate affects learning in three ways. First, via motivation. Uh, that uh, communication is the engine that drives the car of language learning. It is the, the push to learn. Second, inference. So the fact that something was said for the purposes of communication actually licenses you to learn much, much more from that observation than a pure passive observation alone. And finally, that communication creates opportunities for eliciting just the data you need for learning. It changes the nature of the kinds of data that you receive by virtue of the task and drive being to communicate. You get different data than if you were, say, a pure statistical language learner uh, receiving sentences in isolation. But first, I, I want to say that the developmental why of language acquisition is caught up in the question of the origin of language. And so, though there's lots of speculation, we don't know how language, capital L language, actually uh, evolved. Presumably, there's some selective advantage to having a language. Coordinating with other people is helpful. It allows you to hunt better. It allows you to share innovations better. It allows you to coordinate complex social structures. So there's a lot of selective advantage. But we don't know precisely when compositional symbolic systems emerge to support that kind of selective advantage. On the other hand, we can look at languages, this time with a lowercase l. We can look at the diversity of languages across the globe and examine their features. And when we do that, we see that those features, the form of the languages, often reflect their putative function, that is, to communicate. So in the past 15 years, there's been a, an emergent synthesis, a new kind of functionalist synthesis that essentially suggests that many languages have this form-function relationship such that the form reflects the communicative function of the language. Uh, these studies uh, are typically done by examining different languages. So they pick out a particular feature, say the way the language expresses color. Then they evaluate that feature on its communicative efficiency. So would the set of words available in this language allow you to communicate about the kinds of colors that you need to communicate about in your environment in an efficient and effective way? 
Then you look at the variation in color vocabulary, say, across languages. And you can often quantify its efficiency with respect to, say, some random baseline. And the finding is, in fact, that most languages are far more efficient than would be affected, ex expected by chance in the domain of color words and in many others. In fact, languages are often pretty close to as efficient as they can be given the other constraints on their design. So some languages have more color words, for example, here, and some languages have fewer. But no language has three words for green, but no word for red, for example. The partition of color space is an efficient one. And th this uh, comes out again and again when you look at individual features of languages. So th this is just one example of a really rich field which suggests that languages themselves are changed, and they've evolved to become communicative artifacts. Uh, so that's really important when you start to turn to language acquisition because you're not talking about learning something like swimming, which is a task that your body's not adapted for. You're not learning an arbitrary mathematical system like first order logic. Instead, you're learning an optimized artifact. It's more like learning to use a hammer or an iPhone, something that's been designed and evolved over time for a particular function to be learnable to do that. So with that backdrop, I want to discuss now how the communicative task that learners have affects the learning process. And so uh, just to review, I've got motivation, inference, and opportunity. Let's start with motivation. My son Jonah is eight months now. When he was about five months old, he started desperately trying to crawl up on top of anything in his way, whether it's me or furniture or a pillow. Um, and at times he would crawl up and then he'd turn to me Seemed like he was turning to me at least. And he'd go <laughs> And I thought, wait, what are you trying to tell me here? Are you upset? Are you happy? Or do you feel like you're successful? I'm not sure. And, and then I realized this is actually precisely the take home message of a very beautiful paper by Kim Oller and colleagues that examines four to eight month olds vocalizations and finds that they don't know whether those vocalizations are positive or negative in affective valence. Now, that seems like a kind of a null result. I couldn't tell what they were trying to tell me. But in fact, they compare those vocalizations to the vocalizations of other primates, which are essentially never neutral or flexible with respect to their affective content. Other primates express themselves in stereotyped vocalizations that are linked to particular functions. They don't have something like that raspberry that has different functions in different moments. They don't have something like the scream of uh, an annoyed eight-month-old who could also turn, be screaming because he's happy and excited, and you can't tell. You have to look at his face. What, what's going on in there? That scream could mean, wow, I did it, or oh my god, get me out of here, and you just don't know. And that flexibility is a preparation for communication that human infants have. They are flexible vocal learners and vocal producers. It's a preparation for communication. Further, as Mike Tomasello and others have observed, human babies are incredibly excited to share information. Uh, and the fact that babies seem to get intrinsic rewards from social contact and social information is an important fact that I think requires its own evolutionary and psychological explanation. Uh, but in the context of language learning, it means that we have this engine, this push that drives the uh, process forward. So, we used to think that despite children's interest in interaction, they might not understand what the language they were hearing was for. They might just be learning associations between the pleasant sounds that people made while they were having fun interactions and the things around them. This associative view of language, that words were just associations directly between sounds and particular objects or experiences, used to be, I think, a contender as a view of language acquisition. I would say that this viewpoint doesn't look so good anymore. First, even very young infants we now know are starting to learn the meanings of words. This nascent knowledge is present even in six-month-olds uh, who are starting to associate their own name with themselves. Uh, they show the first hints of recognizing common objects, just a little bit in very sensitive eye-tracking measures, but you still see above-chance recognition of some very common objects. Uh, they recognize a nose or a banana or a bottle. Further, they generalize those words in ways that we didn't think was possible. We could, they confuse them with related things, like uh, they find it harder to recognize milk in the context of juice compared with milk in the context of a foot. Further, there's some very clever experiments by Athena Vulamanos and colleagues that suggest that they know that language is for information transfer, that when you say a word that will create the expectation that a person knows which thing you want, whereas if you cough at them, it doesn't do the same thing. 
Finally, when kids start to produce language, their early words aren't just frequent sounds or associations in their environment. I made this point a little bit in my talk on Monday. Uh, so we look at cross-linguistic data on kids' first words, and when we look at those, you don't find them saying the, even though it's the most common word that they've heard, and you don't find them simply expressing their own functional needs, like ow, not a first word, or uh, milk, also not a first word. Instead, first words are super consistent across languages, and they're the names of people, names of animals, social routines, small objects, and cool things in the environment, like balls. It's not need satisfaction. So babies want to communicate, and this shapes how they begin to communicate and what they learn. So let's talk now about the processes of learning. So this is uh, getting to the inferences that are licensed by communication. So here, my thesis is that all language learning is a byproduct of communication. That means that babies learn by first trying to figure out what somebody is saying, and then second, mapping that meaning the thing that they figured out onto the words that they heard. So there is this associative mapping process between form and meaning, but it's not meaning out there in the world, it's meaning in there in the person who is trying to communicate to them. That's the mapping process. So the, that mapping process is what usually gets called learning, and it's very important, and it's likely supported by domain general memory mechanisms that are implicated in what's been called statistical learning. I think we'll talk a bunch more about that process. But what I want to emphasize here is that the input to this system is critical, and the input to those statistical learning mechanisms are the output of communicative inference. So what do I mean by inference here? I mean roughly what a linguist or philosopher or psychologist means when they talk about linguistic pragmatics. That is, the assumption that somebody is trying to communicate to you and the inference about what it is they're trying to communicate given the action that they took. So in linguistic terms, we often talk about this in uh, uh, this pragmatic inference in the context of something like scalar implicature. I tell you, some of the students passed the test. And you infer, oh, that must have been a hard test and not all of them did. You go beyond literally what I said to infer what I meant, which is stronger than the forms of the words I, I used. Now, just for fun, I'm going to show you the stimulus from my favorite experiment that I ever did, which is a kid version of that phenomenon. So we showed children these three faces or other stimuli like them, and we said, my friend has glasses. Actually, Puppet's friend has glasses. Can you find his friend? And what children started to do reliably by just above three years was they chose the friend with glasses but not a hat. And the reasoning process that we think that instantiates is, well, if he wanted the guy with the hat, he would have said hat, but he didn't. He said glasses, so he must mean glasses and not a hat. Same inference, and we've started to push this, try to understand why children a little bit younger than three fail. We think we have some story about that. But the basic idea here is that you can go beyond the forms you hear uh, to infer a tighter, more specific meaning based on the idea that somebody is trying to communicate to you with a particular purpose in mind. So now, how does this relate to word learning? Well, uh, say I say to Jonah, uh, look at the ball. If there's some way he can figure out what I'm talking about, uh, and he knows that that's a ball, then he can learn the mapping between ball and that thing. Or if he knows the word ball, he can use that word to figure out what I'm talking about, but then he doesn't need to learn it. So there's kind of a two-part problem, inference about what I mean and mappings of the words to meaning. Uh, in the philosopher Quine's terms, this is like climbing a chimney. You can't just climb up one side of a chimney. It's too smooth, but if you push on both sides, you can work your way up. I think that's what kids do as they work their way into a language. And of course, it's not such a bad problem because there are a lot of ways that we actually constrain interpretation. Especially at the beginning, many folks have studied the process of pointing and ostensive reference using hands, using gestures, using putting the, uh, the actual object in front of the child. And these kinds of ostension really can bootstrap the process. Now, one thing that's a little controversial here for psycholinguists about my proposal is that I think this, thing, this process works not just for words like ball and shoe, but uh, much broader, uh, in the much broader task of language acquisition as you learn a word like run or as you learn an abstract word like no or some. Um, and of course, what it takes to narrow down meaning doesn't have to just be pointing or seeing an object. It can be other words themselves. 
So if somebody says blip me the ball, you get some clues to what blip means by knowing the words ball and maybe me and knowing something about word order. But the crucial thing is that those cues allow you to figure out what the sentence means and then that meaning inferred from all of the clues around you then becomes the input to mapping. Okay. So the final thing I want to mention uh, about the task of communication is that it creates a tremendous number of opportunities for learning signals beyond pure passive observation of language. And I think this is underappreciated. So in computer science, some of this is called active learning, which is the selection of the right data points for your learning problem. Uh, that's part of the issue here. Uh, and uh, it does distinguish human learners from many computer algorithms that just get a set of labeled points. They don't get a choice about what points are labeled. But there's more than just classic active learning happening here. So first, when you're a baby uh, and you can't understand that much, your caregivers are very motivated to get you to understand something, as every parent knows. You want your child to do what you ask and to understand and share with you. So you simplify as much as is possible to try to get understanding. So that means that because of the task of communication, parents are creating input that is appropriately leveled for the child, which creates a much richer learning signal. Uh, sometimes we call this infant-directed speech, but I think it's actually a much broader phenomenon. It's not just uh, the right slow intonation and pitch variability to capture kids' attention. It's actually all the details of how you use particular words that you know the child might know how you uh, kind of work with the common ground that you know you have with them in order to get your message across. Further, when you're a toddler who actually can communicate some of the time, you can run the conversation. And this means you can learn about objects that you care about or things that you care about by asking questions. And it also means you get great feedback on your own communication, not in terms of direct syntactic correction, which we know that kids don't typically get, but in terms of the extra cues of when I say something and somebody says, huh? I know that something went wrong. I have to repeat myself. I have to alter my message. And when my caregiver rephrases my message back to me, as has been noted by Eve Clark and others, that gives me feedback about what the right form was, the conventional form for my particular meaning. So overall, this is an area where there's a lot to learn as we try to understand this interplay between children's learning mechanisms and the way the environment is structured by the task of communication. All right, so how do children learn language? I'm trying to give you a specific high-level answer, which is through communication. Communication is the fundamental driver of human language. Because languages are evolved for that purpose, then communication motivates the specific content that's learned by young children. They, it, uh, it drives the learning process by providing the inputs to statistical learning and memory, uh, the mapping process. And the communication creates situations, opportunities with more efficient learning and more feedback compared with a pure pile of unlabeled examples. OK, uh, so that's the basic argument. There are a lot of challenges to this viewpoint, which I hope come up in discussion. I'll just mention a couple. Um, probably the most important of these is the question of how learning works in cases where communicative motivation is more variable or even absent. So autism comes to mind, uh, or uh, cases where uh, acquisition is proceeding more by observation. Um, so putting aside the question of whether motivational structure is really the key difference in autism, which I think is something under discussion at the moment, uh, putting that aside, it's still possible to learn in cases where communicative inference is less present or less active. It's just that the input should be more amb ambiguous. So we should predict some kind of delays, sometimes specific delays in such cases, but it shouldn't be impossible to learn. And in fact, I think a lot of what mo modern natural language processing algorithms do is they learn in a case where the data were generated communicatively, but they don't have much of the context. And as such, they need orders of magnitude more data to get a good model of the language than a child does. OK. There are also cultures with less communication with children. And in these cases, children may need to do their initial bootstrapping by learning from observation. But once they talk, they get involved in this virtuous cycle of communication more directly as well. And so we could make some predictions that would be subject to test about uh, cross-cultural variation. All right, to conclude, uh, the drive to communicate is an important motivator of language acquisition, but it's more than just motivation. I've argued that it affects every aspect of the task of language acquisition, and I think a research goal for the future is to better understand these inferences and these opportunities that communication creates. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Now we're going to hear from Caroline Rowland. I can't draw, so you're not going to get any lovely pictures from me. Um, thank you for inviting me. I am very excited to take part in this discussion, not just for the chance to talk about language acquisition with Professor Frank and with you, but for a very particular reason. Research on language acquisition has been dominated for too long by the nature-nurture debate. The debate between nativists and empiricists or constructivists which resolves around the question of whether the children's environment contains enough information to learn language without the need for a powerful innate linguistic knowledge. This debate has led to entrenched, almost religious polarization of positions, with some people seemingly incapable of seeing the merits in the arguments from the other sides. I think this argument has become unproductive and stale and has been so for a very long time. The fact that Professor Frank and I are both here illustrates, I hope, that the field has moved on. Because this is a discussion between two people who acknowledge there's merit in both sides of the argument. Children come to the language learning task with some sort of innately specified learning mechanisms. And these mechanisms are constrained by biases on what can be learned. And maybe even by innate knowledge. But also, children's acquisition process is at its very heart, at its very core, driven by the environment in which the child lives. Not just the language environment, but everything that she hears, sees, touches, feels, the whole multimodal environment. And because we've both acknowledged this, we can move on to a proper evidence-based discussion. How do children learn language? Now, Mike has focused his opening remarks on the statement, communication is the fundamental driver of human language learning. Language emerges from basic mechanisms of learning and memory applied in communicative interactions. I completely agree that communication is the fundamental driver of human language learning. So should we go home? <laughs> The fact that Chomsky fundamentally disagreed with this statement, I think, has caused our research field enormous harm. And I am really pleased that this view is finally becoming mainstream and undisputed, as it should have been from the beginning. But I'm not sure. I think the jury may still be out on the idea that language emerges from basic mechanisms of learning and memory. And this is because I focus my career on trying to figure out what those mechanisms are. And I suspect that the evidence is pointing us towards something more complex and sophisticated than this statement implies. A whole range of interacting cognitive, perceptual, and sociocognitive mechanisms, some specialized for language maybe, some domain general, some species general, some human specific, some of which we understand quite well, and some of which we have absolutely no idea about. So how do children learn language? To explain why I think uh, the process is quite complicated. Um, I want to start with the actual process of learning a language. Because we use language so effortlessly, it's easy to forget how many complex tasks we have to master in order to learn language. So first, the child has to learn to understand and produce speech sounds like p and b and m. And this isn't easy as you may think. Think about it. What is the difference between pat and bat? What do you have to do to change from saying pat to bat? Think about it. Under your breath, go pat, go bat. What do you do? How do you change it? We do this effortlessly and unconsciously, but this small change involves a complex, precise combination of movements of vocal cords, mouth, lips, and tongue, etc. And you learn to do this for dozens and dozens of speech sounds in the first year of life. Second, you have to learn to understand the meaning of words. This also isn't as simple as you may think. Let's say I point over to the edge of the lecture hall and say, look, gather guy. To what am I referring? The whole lecture hall? The group of people? Am I calling somebody's name? Uh, am I commenting how dark it is at the back? Or am I pointing out somebody who's gently falling asleep? This is what Quine calls the problem of reference. When children hear a word, how do they figure out what it means? So there, are given, there are many different possibilities. Then you have to learn grammar. And all languages, as we know, have different grammatical systems. So children have to learn their own language's grammar. 
In English, we use word order to indicate who did what to whom. So the man bit the dog has a very different meaning from the dog bit the man. In German, you use case markers on the determiner to indicate who did what to whom. So actually, you could say the man bit the dog, and it would mean the dog bit the man, as long as you used uh, der Hund and den Mann. No, the other way around, den Hund and den Mann. So German has four, I don't speak German. German has four of these grammatical, German, I'm trying to learn Dutch, but that's easier. Um, German has four of these grammatical cases, nominant, accusative, dative, and genitive, and Finnish has 15. So please don't try and learn Finnish. But once a child has mastered a grammar, there's one more task to solve, figuring out what people actually mean. And Mike's uh, touched on this a little bit. What we say is rarely exactly what we mean. Take this sentence, oh, I feel like a pizza tonight. This does not mean that you literally feel like you are a pizza. It means that you feel like eating a pizza. And a whole range of communicative devices depend on us understanding that what we say is not what we mean. Sarcasm, humour, deception, as well as everyday conversation. So is the drive to communicate enough to allow children to solve all of these tasks? It causes children to want to learn, but the key question for me is how do they learn? How do they build up this knowledge? And I think in order to solve this puzzle of language acquisition, we need to know three things. First, we need to know what the learning mechanisms are, how they process incoming information, and how they use this information to build mature linguistic knowledge. And there are likely to be a number of mechanisms involved, mechanisms for categorization, for intention reading, for encoding linguistic information in memory and storing it and then retrieving it. Systems that allow us to map abstract concepts at one level, like phonemes, to abstract concepts at another, like words. Systems that allow us to assign causal connections to associations or event sequences, etc., etc. For most of these, we don't know very much about how they work, but at least when it comes to language. But there is one that we do know quite a lot about, statistical learning mechanisms. And this mechanism doesn't seem to be able to solve one of the fundamental problems of language acquisition. The statistical learning mechanism is a pattern recognizer that recognizes and builds connections between phonemes or words or grammatical structures that share structural and or functional properties. And Mike mentioned this in his talk in the context of word learning. I think if every time um, somebody says the word ball um, and you can sort of figure out that somebody's intention is to label an object in the world and every time you hear the word ball, there's a ball in your environment, um, you will likely learn or almost certainly learn that this name refers to this object. And the same cross-situational statistical learning can be used to solve a range of language learning tasks. It can be used to segment words from a continuous speech stream. It can be used to learn syntactic categories, so which words are nouns and verbs, or at least some syntactic categories. It can be used to create phonemic distinctions like the difference between but and per. And it can be used to learn non-adjacent dependencies. So, for example, if you have an is in a sentence in English, it has to be followed by a verb with an ing ending. So you say he is singing, he is dancing, he is crying, not he is sing, he is dance, he is cry. So this is definitely a basic learning mechanism that is definitely involved in language acquisition. But is it enough? And a lot of people think not. There's one classic language learning problem that statistical learning mechanisms haven't yet been able to solve. And this is the fact that humans can form connections between concepts based on abstract, not perceptual similarities. So children learn that the cat, in the sentence, the cat chases the mouse, shares the same role as Mary in the sentence, Mary kisses John. Even though there's no perceptual overlap either in the words, the cat and Mary, or the action, chases versus kisses. In 1999, Marcus and colleagues showed that infants can learn these sort of abstract algebraic rules very quickly. They can learn open-ended abstract relationships into which we can substitute arbitrary items. Infants were habituated to three-word sequences consisting of pseudo-words, so things like gati, ga, uh, li, na, li, and then were tested on new three-word sequences made up of completely new words, so wo, fei, wo. The only relationship between the words in the habituation phase and the test phase was abstract algebraic relations. They both followed an abstract ABA pattern, or in a second experiment, an AAB or ABB pattern. 
Now, because none of the test syllables occurred in the habituation phase, the infants could not be doing this based on uh, computing transitional probabilities. And because the test and habituation sentences were the same length and were generated by a computer, infants can't distinguish them based on properties like number of syllables or prosody. Yet the infants were able to recognise the abstract relationships between the words in the habituation and the test phase. Now, the publication of Marcus's paper stimulated a flurry of papers presenting different computational models, implementing a variety of statistical learning mechanisms trying to solve the problem. And interestingly, a brilliant review that's come out this year by a postdoc in my department, Raquel Alhama, and a colleague of hers, Willem Zaudema, this review showed that none of these models can completely solve the problem. This is because all of them require there to be some sort of concrete perceptual overlap between uh, habituation and test phase items. And there doesn't seem to be any in the Marcus task. So Marcus argued on the basis of this work that we need at least two learning mechanisms, one for statistical learning and one for learning abstract algebraic rules. Now, Marcus may be right. He may be wrong. Of course, we never should say never. Maybe we've missed something, and basic statistical techniques, uh, learning techniques can solve the problem. But it is quite interesting that after 20 years of trying, we haven't managed it yet. And as an aside, I haven't followed this literature on what aspects of these tasks other primates, like tamarin monkeys, can do. So this might be an interesting point for our discussion. What can monkeys with basic statistical learning mechanisms do? But what I do know is that non-human primates tend to need a lot of training to succeed at statistical learning tasks, whereas human infants master them in minutes, sometimes seconds. So maybe as well as the drive to communicate, we have a much more sophisticated pattern extraction system than other animals, one that takes generalising one abstraction step further, if you like, or potentially one that's qualitatively different from those of other animals, that can extract algebraic rules without any overlap in perceptual features, or maybe not. But we need to know to solve the puzzle of language acquisition. The second thing we need to know to solve the puzzle of language acquisition is what constraints guide the working of the learning mechanisms. Of course, there are innate constraints. To misquote Mike Maratsos, we don't want a theory that predicts that nearly everything generalizes to everything. We need constraints to guide generalization. But we don't yet know what constraints we need to build into the learning system. Some constraints are uncontroversial. We do have distributional learning mechanisms, and these are biased to generalise on the basis of the frequency of co-occurrence. All the work on distributional learning suggests this. But there are others. Some people suggest we also need to add low-level perceptual constraints that guide what parts of the sentence we should pay attention to. So Slobin, Dan Slobin has suggested operating principles like pay attention to the ends of words, or keep morphine order within a word consistent, or try to have a one-to-one -one form function mapping. Others have suggested more complex, high-level cognitive constraints. Deirdre Gentner suggests that in order to learn language, we need an innate structure mapping mechanism that recognises commonalities in roles like agent or patient and analogises across events that base on the basis that participants share the same roles. So we recognise the similarity in roles between cat in Cat Pushes the Dog and Bird in Bird Chases the Mouse. Uh, Adele Goldberg has said something similar, but she calls it a pragmatic, pragmatic mapping generalisation. And then, of course, there are those who argue that we're born with universal grammar, which is innate knowledge of syntactic categories such as noun and verb, innate constraints or principles such as structure dependence and subjacency, and parameters such as the head direction parameter. I think the evidence suggests that we do have some quite complex abstract constraints that govern how we map language onto concepts. For example, Cindy Fisher has produced some really nice work that shows that young infants have a predisposition to map nouns onto participants in events in a one-to-one -one fashion. And this leads them to make mistakes early on with sentences like, John and Mary are pushing. So young infants tend to interpret these conjoined agent sentences as meaning that one person, John, pushes another, Mary. So they interpret them as reading, John pushes Mary. And it's only as they learn more about their language, and particularly the meaning of the word and, that they correct this mistake. 
So I suspect that language acquisition is guided by constraints on how we interpret events, not just low-level perceptual constraints, but higher-order cognitive constraints that act on abstract categories like agents and patients. But I don't know if these are innate. I'm actually most attracted by Annette Karmeloff-Smith's view on this, that we may be born with basic, innate, primitive, low-level, domain, general biases, but these develop into sophisticated, abstract, domain-specific concepts throughout development as we interact with our environment. So on this view, innate low-level pro uh, processes and biases are important, but so are developmentally significant milestones, like the development of joint attention. But that milestone itself may emerge from a lower-level intrinsic bias, say like the preference to look at faces. But until we know more about what constraints language acquisition requires and whether these constraints are innate or are learnt, it's hard to say. The third thing and the final thing that we need to know to solve the puzzle of language acquisition is the role of knowledge. New input has to be integrated into the child's existing knowledge store so that the child's existing knowledge at the point of learning will determine how new information is represented. This is obvious on a really simple level. If you already understand the word ball, the way you interpret the sentence kick the ball will be different than if you don't already understand the word ball. But it's actually likely to be much more complicated than this. For example, there's a paper on so-called construction conspiracies that I really like by Kirsten Abersmith and Heike Behrens that was done here in Leipzig at the Ava Institute. And it shows that the knowledge that children have already acquired can either help or hinder the acquisition of new grammatical structures. So, and this is where I pretend I know German. In German, there are two passives, the Sein passive, which roughly equivalent to something like uh, the rice was in a cooked state. So it's a stative passive in uh, And then there's the Verden passive, which is, uh, provides the meaning of a sort of eventive meaning, roughly equivalent to the rice became cooked in English. And Abbott Smith and Behrens showed that the Sein passive was acquired earlier than the Verden passive and earlier than we would expect based on its frequency in the input because its acquisition was facilitated by earlier acquired constructions such as the Sein copula or the Sein intransitive that are morphologically similar. So the acquisition of a uh, morphologically similar construction helped the acquisition of a new, more complex construction. And some recent work by Gary Jones and myself suggests that the role of existing knowledge can actually change the nature of the learning task itself. So existing knowledge matters, but actually in the field we've hardly touched the surface of this idea. So in conclusion, I agree that the drive to communicate and that basic processes of learning and memory applied in communicative interaction are central to language learning. But are they enough? We just don't know. Before we can answer this question, we need to know much more about the mechanisms that human children use to learn language, the constraints and biases that determine what and how these mechanisms learn, and the role of the knowledge that children bring to the language learning task. But if you force me to bet on the outcome, and I would only bet a very small amount, I suspect that the human cognitive system is probably going to be specialised in more ways than just a drive to communicate. I think it's likely that humans have evolved specialised learning mechanisms that are capable of building out of information in our environment more complex, more abstract information more quickly and more efficiently than other animals. I don't know if these mechanisms are specialised to language as well, if they're driven by language-specific constraints. I don't really care. When we know what they are, we'll know if they're specific to language. But one thing I do know is that we won't know the answer to this question until we build more detailed, process-oriented models of exactly what mechanisms, constraints and knowledge children bring to the task. And that's the only way we'll solve the puzzle of language acquisition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to move over to the table. Is this working now? OK. Are the others working? Yep. Perfect. OK, so we're, now we're going to have a, um, a little more um, organized discussion now. I don't know, before, I, I've prepared some questions, but is there something that um, 
you would like to get into before? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think I, I have a couple of responses, which maybe we could give Caro also some time to respond to. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, which is great, because I, I think there were a couple of general points of real consensus here. Um, and then one, uh, I thought, very productive uh, point of dissensus, which I want to highlight. Um, so uh, two general points of consensus. So first, um, I completely agree that the right way forward here is building explicit models. And in particular, in the case of cumulative knowledge, I think uh, there is a lot of work to do in this area, the, the work that, that Caro is doing on building models that accumulate knowledge over developmental time is really pointing a way forward and is a real challenge to some of the Bayesian traditions that I was trained in. And one of the reasons why I, I have been investigating a broader range of modeling options, because modeling and development in the kind of pure rational constructivist tradition doesn't have as uh, strong a, um, a way of uh, describing processes of developmental change as, as I hope for. So, so I think that that's exactly right as to the next direction. It's just a future goal. Uh, the second uh, point of, of consensus here is uh, the point of many different mechanisms. And, and here I think I, I want to clarify that I certainly don't deny uh, categorization mechanisms, production systems, uh, event structure, and causality. Um, the, to the extent that I have any kind of stronger view, I would push these outside of language and outside of the evolutionary processes, or mostly, with the exception of production system, outside of the uh, evolutionary processes that are most strongly implicated in the emergence of language. Um, so uh, kind of primate event representation and object representation and so forth. I think there's more evidence on continuity. Um, uh, and I love the, the Karmeloff Smith view that you shared about developmental emergence being part and parcel in each of those cases as well. Um, the point where there's a real substantive uh, discussion to be had, um, and, and this, this I think is, is going to be an empirical question, is uh, the question um, that you started with about uh, I'm going to gloss this as whether thematic or, or, or uh, uh, syntactic rules, uh, sorry, thematic or uh, syntactic roles are more like rules or more like statistics. Uh, and here I, I think we could very, you know, we very reasonably can disagree because the evidence is really complicated. Uh, I think I tend to, on the balance to think that these roles are more like statistics. Uh, so um, with just three really quick points on that. The first is that I think rule learning, the rule learning phenomenon as discussed by Gary Marcus initially and uh, now as uh, used fairly widely in, in a lot of research, is actually a very specific phenomenon that does not generalize uh, broadly outside of that particular case of identity and repetition. It doesn't look as much like natural language as I think Marcus argued it did. Um, the second point is that uh, there are general models of uh, statistical learning, well, statistical learning writ broadly for thematic roles uh, that don't look like kind of classic word segmentation. They look much more like modern machine learning. But for example, the work that Sharon Goldwater and her colleagues have done on uh, acquiring uh, word order uh, regularities via statistical inference over corpora, I think, points away there that um, makes use of abstraction, but doesn't make use of algebraic rules in the Barca sense, per se. Um, and, and the final point is that uh, I really liked this, this review paper, but I think it, it does, uh, that you mentioned about rule learning, it does neglect some of the newer uh, neural network work. So the machine learning world has just accelerated incredibly in the past five, seven years, and some work uh, out of uh, DeepMind, um, now generalized by a number of other groups, does suggest that uh, well, maybe this is a broader take home from the, the neural network work that uh, architectural constraints can lead to huge differences in learning. So the initial insight was that an architecture that looks a little bit like our vi primary visual system could produce recognition results in a learning model that were incredibly sophisticated. But the particular DeepMind result that I found thought provoking was that an architecture that is designed to learn any sort of relational structure from one type of entity to another can learn Marcus rules. Um, so you, ha you need to have a bias towards relations, but you don't need to have an algebraic bias in this sort of neural network. Um, and that's, I think, a real, it's a very, uh, maybe it's a very Karmeloff Smith point that uh, basic architectural constraints can lead to the emergence of really uh, decidedly unpredicted uh, developmental phenomena. So those are the reasons why I tend more towards the statistics side on this, but I do think that um, the thematic and syntactic role learning is a, pretty much a key locus for this kind of argument now. Yeah, so um, I, a lot of this is going to be yes, I agree. Um, 
So I should probably say at the outset, I try, I'm not a theorist. I feel, I see myself as a real experimentalist. If I was a physicist, I would be running experiments and somebody else would be creating the theories. So my approach is always going to be, yeah, let's see what the evidence suggests. And if, as you say, and I haven't kept up with the literature, there are models that can take the basic statistical learning mechanism and use it to learn thematic and syntactic roles. That's really great. But if also, as you say, that what we're looking at is the development of something that's actually building something conceptually complex in order to learn those syntactic roles, that's a little bit different from a basic statistical learning mechanism. So the question is, what constraints does this model have? Um, are, do we see those? Con is there evidence that those constraints are also acting in children? So I love modeling and I use it a lot, but the role of modeling is to mimic the data and then make new predictions that you test on an experiment. Because in a model, you can basically fit any data you want by tweaking the parameters. If it doesn't make uh, predictions about real human behavior, it's not a model of development. I would say one other thing, which is that. Um, a basic, if, if you're talking about a basic statistical learning mechanism, remember in language that it's learning a lot of different things on different levels. So we think that statistical learning can be used to learn the difference between a pert and a but, right? That there's a, a binary distribution to the sort of sounds that equate to pert and the sounds that equate to but, and we can use statistical learning to learn that. But then we're using the same mechanism to learn cross-situationally the difference between dog and cat, that if you're a dog, you can't be a cat, but if you're a dog, you can be a puppy. So some, you know, two words, some words are mutually exclusive and some aren't. And then you also have to learn the difference between truth and fact, right? So you need to be able to use probably functional distribution analysis to learn the difference between very abstract words. And you need the same mechanism to learn the difference between nouns and verbs and subjects and objects. So you're putting an awful lot on a basic statistical learning mechanism that a rat has. And I would suggest that the basic statistical learning mechanism that the rat has can't do all of that. And what I'm interested in is, in that case, what do we have to build in? And if there are models that are building things in that can do all of those things, that's great. Yeah, yeah I, I, so I, um, to try to put a finer point on, on this, this last point, the question, I think uh, a point of agreement is that abstractions for that learning are critical. And they're going to be abstractions at a variety of levels of, uh, of representation in language from uh, the lowest level, the, the um, sound categories, to the pro arguably the highest level, the event structure. The question is the extent to which the architecture, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, external non-linguistic systems, such as uh, kind of um, the, the basic representation of events in memory, can provide that structure, or whether uh, language is required to create those abstractions. And in the end, that's going to uh, really be a, 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 the kind of question that's answered in part by comparative and cross-linguistic evidence. So I, I think that's, that's the locus where we could productively try to figure out, OK, what are the kinds of experiments that would convince uh, the community one way or the other? To kind of pick up on the, the idea that um, comparing learning mechanisms or learning processes in humans to other animals. Um, so, so far, the kind of mechanisms that you've been discussing so far um, are more, um, for example, statistical learning mechanisms, but they don't relate that much to, um, to communication itself. So animals communicate with one another. Um, so what do you think does the looking at the, the situated, the ways in which communication is situated in animals actually tells us something about um, like the, the kind of environment that these uh, learning mechanisms have to be placed in in order to enable something like language learning? Well, so, so the first place I'd go with this is, is so we can distinguish uh, the kind of environmental requirements of communication, um, and, and we should talk about that. But the first place I'd go is to Grice's distinction between natural and non-natural meaning. Uh, so uh, for Grice, a natural meaning is smoke means fire. That is, it is a direct signal of the fire. And one argument about many animal communication systems is that these are uh, natural meaning. That is, there is no process of uh, intended inference for another uh, a receiver. Uh, so some of the uh, kind of innateness evidence on um, alarm calls and vervet monkeys feels like it pushes that way. Um, certainly bee signaling evidence pushes that way. Um, there are other animal signaling systems where you might uh, kind of 
disagree. Um, for example, a kind of dolphin uh, sort of name signaling or something like this. But uh, for many uh, non-human communication systems, we, I think we're talking about communication in the natural meaning sense. That is information transfer in the system uh, to a, a, an observer who's perceiving it, but not um, via an intention to communicate to an audience. And you know, the, 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 we may kind of you know, want to sort of drive a thinner wedge in there, but that would be my first pass. Uh, to quickly respond to that, there's actually kind of if you look at um, our closest living relatives, so great apes, there's actually pretty good evidence that they do, in, uh, in effect, in, communicate intentionally in the sense that they they have um, a certain goal in mind when they're communicating. So, so in a sense, and also kind of flexibly switch between signals depending on whether or not um, they are they, they reach their goal. So, it's suggesting that some of this this intentionality that you're hinting at is actually present um, in our closest living relatives, which is kind of the most relevant um, in terms of when we are thinking about kind of the evolutionary add-ons that have to be put onto these communi communicative systems that exist in other animals to get to what humans are doing. Yeah, so, so the, the locus for theory then is gonna be, you know, what the precise distinctions are here, whether it's, uh, you know, the, um, the depth of the recursive thinking in terms of the communicative intention or whether it's the, um, uh, alignment of goals between the two communicators. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've kind of defer in many ways to the experts on this kind of thing, but uh, it seems like it, a first cut that worked for some of the phenomena was uh, uh, that it worked in competitive contexts, but not there was less cooperative uh, inference. And certainly, in, in terms of human signaling, there's a real distinction between competitive games and cooperative games, where uh, you know. Uh, competitive games like The Prisoner's Dilemma have kind of very different equilibrium structure than aligned games where we're just trying to get our, ourselves both to know that we're talking about this thing. So for me, it, I think whether you think it's a difference of degree or of quali actually a qualitative difference, it's complexity, abstraction, and productivity. And for me, the parade example is syntax. Why on earth do we as humans have a productive syntactic system? Children aren't just learning to put words into sentences, into complex sentences. You know, as soon as children go beyond eat cake or mummy dog, they've gone way beyond any primate that we've ever managed to teach communication to. And children aren't just, you know, putting together nice, complex, nice sentences in the right way. They're making a whole load of systematic errors that really get across their communicative intention but are completely bizarre. So my PhD thesis was on WH questionnaires, and I had things like, you know, why he giggles, mummy? Mummy, why his head spins round? Mummy, why doesn't he does why doesn't why does he doesn't do this? Why can't he can't do it? Why will he won't do it? And then you have, you know, rund and um, uh, we have rund and we have eated and we have child instead of children. And then we have he giggled me or um, a whole load of overgeneralization errors where they're using verbs in the wrong sentence. All of this is communicative, but they are for some reason, and, and they, all of these errors tell you about how they're building their syntactic system, that they really are trying to extract what probabilistic rules, uh, probabilistic tendencies or, or rules govern the syntactic system in their language. So we know that they are constructing a syntax. Not one single animal that we know of, either spontaneously or after intensive training, constructs a complex syntax system. So when we know why we as humans do that, I think we will have put our finger on the difference, one of the main differences between us and them. Would that be the, the, the point where you put the, um, kind of what you would say, that this is a defining feature of language in the sense that if, if some, some animal masters this, then they have mastered language? No, because there isn't a defining feature of language. I mean, there's lots of them. There's compositionality, there's productivity of syntax. And I think if I was to say there was a defining feature, it's that everything that we do is done at a more complex, more abstract, more representational level than anything that you can get another animal to do. So we can, um, it seems to me that in a lot of ways, animal communication systems share some of the basics of everything that we can do, but then we somehow <coughs> take it one step further or two steps further, and it becomes more abstract and more complex. And so, no, there isn't a defining... If there's going to be a defining feature, it's that. We're somehow able to do it better and more complex and more abstract. Why? I don't know. And to rephrase the why question, um, so, can you, I mean, this may be more a point of speculation, 
Um, why do humans need language? What do we need it for? I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mike put his finger on it. I mean, when we look at children trying to communicate, um, there is a drive there. I mean, if you've got children, they just want to communicate with you. Um, and you just don't see this in other animals. So whatever evolutionary reason, and I don't speculate about you know, language evolution in terms of what drove it, but we have. Children have this drive to communicate for whatever it came, and that's the reason that we develop language. <laughs> There's a lot of I don't know, I'm afraid. But. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. That's kind of a, also pointing out to the people in the audience that what, what work is left to be done. <laughs> um, okay. So coming back to the actual process of, uh, of language learning, um, so do children learn language differently at different ages? So, so far, I think we've been discussing more like what do kids have, be, have to bring to the table in order to kind of get language learning off the ground. But then they'll actually learn a language. Does that change the way that they learn language? You've hinted to some of this before, kind of, um, that there's some knowledge that structures this, but are the actual, the mechanisms themselves, do they, are they transformed over time with, uh, with learning language? So we had a conversation about this uh, over Skype, and um, we actually both agree that with we agree with each other, but are not with a lot of the field, and the answer is no. But Mike, you had a really great explanation of why you think the mechanisms don't change. Yeah, I th so, um, you know, as I grew up as a kind of language scientist, right, you, the curriculum in linguistics is based on levels of representation, phonology and morphology, uh, lexicon, um, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, right? We have this very hierarchical structure, and we think about the world in this way, and we think about acquisition as sequentially proceeding through each of these things. But when you start to look at the data, uh, both um, data from, uh, say, large-scale meta-analyses. So uh, my collaborator, um, Alex Christia, has conducted many meta-analyses of early language. When you look at the time scale of acquisition for each of these processes, they all look like they're happening at once. And then second, in computational models, when you fit models that try to learn one of these things, uh, it's actually a lot harder than if you fit models that try to learn two or three of them at once. So Mark Johnson, a computational linguist, has called this the idea of synergies between uh, levels of representation. So, so uh, in other words, I think the, the evidence, both empirical and theoretical, speaks to the idea that everything is happening at once. Uh, and then this has a downstream consequence for our, uh, our hypotheses about kind of staging, which is if everything is happening at once, then it's, the processes are continuous, or so the mechanisms are continuous, even as the phenomena that emerge from those mechanisms can look discontinuous. So uh, it looks discontinuous when you start to combine words for the first time uh, because there is a qualitative change in the nature of the child's output, but that doesn't uh, imply a qualitative change in the nature of the processes that are operating under the surface. Indeed, those could have been processes of accumulation that are completely continuous, but that now have enough structure combined with the productive wherewithal to get across two words rather than one. Yeah, and I think... Um so I completely agree with this, and I think also, I mentioned it a bit in my talk, but we've massively underestimated the role of knowledge in changing the way the same mechanisms can actually learn from the same data. Um, so there's a lovely paper from Erica Hoff that shows that the input, um, uh, the effect of the input can actually change the acquisition process as you go along. So for example, um, what it looked like was that uh, in her data, it looked like that younger children tended to benefit from repetition. So hearing a few words an awful lot of time, those were the children who uh, seemed to learn language, seemed to learn vocabulary most easily. And then as the children got a bit older, they seemed to benefit from diversity, from hearing a lot of different words, but maybe only a few times each. And then as the children got older, they benefited most from hearing really rare words, so really rare words and weird constructions. And in a recent paper, we modeled this process, and it turns out it's all based on, it, you can explain it all based on the amount of knowledge that you have. In other words, um, when you don't have very much knowledge in your lexicon, it takes you a long time to learn uh, the phonetic form of an individual word. So you need to hear it an awful lot of times. But as soon as you've got any amount of sort of sublexical chunks of information of phoneme sequences or uh, small words in your lexicon, you can actually bootstrap off that knowledge to uh, interpret or uh, 
remember more of the, the new words coming in and learn more out of new words coming in more quickly. So you can actually, the amount of knowledge that you have can actually change from needing a lot of repetition of one word in order to encode it to suddenly only needing to hear a word one, one or two times because you're bootstrapping off the knowledge you already have in your lexicon. And so it looks like there's a qualitative change in how children are learning words from their input. It's not a qualitative change. The same process, it's just that the information that you use to learn that process learn that word is is different yeah it's funny just to note that uh, it used to be that continuity theory was associated with uh, theories in which there were uh, strong innate constraints posited um, and I, I think this is kind of an interesting uh, flip in that I think both of us are favor uh, favor theories where there's real continuity in the learning mechanisms but those learning mechanisms lead to the emergence of uh, what looks like new representational structures Okay, so then, um, so now we've talked a bit about the uh, kind of basic mechanisms uh, that drive language learning. So where does variability come from um, between children? <laughs> <laughs> now, if we assume that kind of there, there, there are these basic mechanisms that, are, that need to be in place for children to, in order to be able to learn language. So to kind of rephrase the question, if I give you a thousand euros and then you have to bet on three things you need to know about the child in order to predict um, their language learning. What things do you want to know about the child? OK, so we need to know. It can also be four or two. We need to know, um, well, first of all, we need to solve the genetic problem of language. We need to know what genes um, there are that contribute to language learning and how these genes interact and what effect they have on the brain. So can I have the bet like a few hundred years in the future? <laughs> because I need Simon Fisher's language and genetics department to solve the problem of what genes underlie language. And then we will know how, um, the, when we will know what genes are involved in building the baby's brain so that it is uh, capable of learning language. So that's the first thing we would need to know. What is the genetic code underlying a language-ready brain? We have no idea. FOXP2, yes. <laughs> Anything else? There's a couple more. Um, and then the second thing we need to know is obviously uh, about, we need to know more about the children's environment. And not just their language environment, but they're the prenatal environment. So there's, you know, we know that brain development is affected by stress hormones from the mum, the mum's diet, whether the mum drinks alcohol when she's pregnant, a whole load of things about this. Um, even characteristics of the father. Um, and so we need to know a lot more about, we need to be able to map out the whole child's environment from conception all the way up to their first word. Um, so again, I need another 100 years, 200 years, 300 years to do that because everything in the environment affects the children. But interestingly, it doesn't necessarily affect it in the way that we think it affects it. And something that worries me is, at the moment is there's a big debate. Well, there seems to be a consensus that the amount that you talk to children, the more you talk to children, the faster they learn words. So it's really good to do a lot of talking to children. I don't think that's a causal relationship. I don't think the more you talk to children, the faster they learn words. I think there's a whole load of questions um, wrapped up in that. It, I'm not sure that producing lots and lots of, you know, producing some words lots and lots and lots of times really helps. It may be that hearing a big diversity of words really helps children learn language, but saying what's that, what's that, what's that, what's that three million times instead of two million times is not going to help your child learn language. So I think there's a little bit of the relationship between the input and acquisition is a little bit more complicated than some people are making out. Um, I also, it, we also don't actually know, we know there is a correlation between the amount you talk to children and how quickly they learn, but we don't know what the causes are. There's two possibilities. One is the genetic code, that parents who have the communicative genes, whatever they are, have children who have the communicative genes, whatever they are. Um, and so these are just false gene environment correlations. Or it could be um, that children who have a communicative gene um, sort of do a lot more kind of communicative pushing to their parents, talk to me, talk to me, whatever. And so those parents then give them a lot of input. So it could be um, that um, actually what's happening is that the children are, 
have a drive to communicate. Some children have a bigger drive to communicate and their parents are responding. And actually, it's the drive to communicate that's pushing vocabulary acquisition, not the input. So the classic correlation is not cause makes me worry. The environment definitely, definitely matters, but what it is in the environment, we don't know. So genes, environment, and learning mechanisms. We need to know more about the learning mechanisms to explain variability. Yeah, if I were taking this bet, I think I, uh, my breakdown is somewhat similar, uh, but I, uh, maybe a little bit different. So I, I think about this in the kind of classic Bronfenbrenner circles uh, type of framework. So we need the uh, broader environment, we need the local environment, and we need the factors internal to the child. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take the bet now rather than in, um, in, in 100 years, um, and my predictors are going to be much worse. But uh, for the broader environment, uh, here's an important and sad one. I think you know, if we were in the US, I would say give me their zip code. Um, that is, the uh, social environment that they're, uh, they're um, learning in is going to determine things about class, about the structure of their caregiving, about the structure of the uh, educational opportunities they're afforded when they hit school, about the structure of the educational opportunities informally in their home and in their environment that they have access to. Those are unfortunately going to be determinants, at least as with respect to the kinds of complex language that get leveraged in school settings. Um, and I tend to think that those are going to have some causal influence on the basis of some econometric evidence when you move people around, when you uh, uh, provide access to these kinds of opportunities, books and other things. Um, then with respect to the home environment, I agree that the causal relationship here is much more complicated. Um, but in terms of predictors, I would say you should still tell me about how much their parent is talking to them when they're 18 months. And you know that the reason I'd ask for that is not because I think that's the direct cause of most things, although certainly uh, experience with individual words is prerequisite to the skill of recognizing and producing them, uh, but because it's a good proxy for some of the other causal variables you described. Um, quantity is easy to measure. It's a robust measurement. And so it's a proxy for, is this, do they have a parent who wants to communicate to them, and do they elicit communication? So uh, maybe you can get a good uh, prediction because this non-causal variable is picking up the causal uh, forces interior to the system, that is the child himself, and exterior, that is in the parent's overall motivation. With respect to the child, what can we measure now that would predict their language? Uh, I think actually the evidence, the psychometric evidence suggests that language is a very strong, it's a big emergent construct, and it's very tightly uh, woven. That is, all aspects of a child's language correlate with one another, and they correlate quite strongly across the child's lifespan. So um, one study that I like suggests that uh, two-year-old language measured in many different ways predicts four-year-old language very, very well. Another study suggests that speed of processing and vocabulary at 18 months and at two years can predict out to school performance at six or at eight. Uh, so that continuity means that if we measure anything reliably about a baby, and that's no joke, then we should be able to make good predictions about them in the future. So I would actually, I would say, does this baby habituate quickly? Do they learn things fast? If they learn thing fa things fast, we know that's a pretty decent predictor of general intelligence. And what's our best measure of general intelligence in infancy and early childhood? It's actually language. So if I were betting now, I'd say how much the parents say at 18 months, uh, what, how fast does the baby habituate? I guess I can't help myself to 18 months and, but you know, some, somewhere in here at 12 months, uh, habituation, uh, parent language, and zip code. So there's one thing I want to take issue with there, which is about early language predicting later language. And you're right, if you correlate early anything, one-year-old gestures with 18-month vocabulary, they'll correlate highly. 18-month vocabulary with two-year-old two-word combinations, they'll correlate highly. But a correlation is one thing. Predicting individual performance is another. And there's this really interesting, well, it's not interesting, it's actually worrying problem that I'm coming across at the moment, where um, uh, in the UK they want to create a test at two and a half years of age um, for children's language that will predict reliably whether or not those ch child goes on to develop a language delay at four or five, or as early as you can predict it, which in the UK is four or five. It is impossible to predict uh, whether or not a child will have a language delay from their language at two and a half. There are slow children that stay slow. There are slow children that go, that speed up and are fine at four and a half. There are fast children that stay fast and there are fast children that go slow at two and a half. Adding 
Sex, gender into your equation doesn't add to, predict, add to the prediction. Adding socioeconomic status into the equation doesn't help with the predicting prediction. Adding um, uh, whether or not the baby is premature or not doesn't add to the accuracy of the prediction. Um, think of something, a demographic variable that you think will predict children's language. It doesn't. So we cannot, it's actually impossible to take a child at two and a half and predict whether they'll have a language delay two and a half years later. So you get correlations, which are, in general, fast kids tend to be fast and slow kids tend to be slow. Predicting an individual child's trajectory is currently impossible. We don't know. So, and that's worrying. So it says something about... The reliability of our correlational data, we are not able to predict individual children. I, um, I think, first, the, the, uh, the caution to, in the move from correlation to prediction is completely warranted. So um, in, as scientists, we can make our best guess and we can parcel out that variance. The question of what level of variance prediction we need before we move to policy is going to be the critical one. And I, I would completely agree that we're very premature on move to policy implementation or move to technology implementation where we're using uh, the measures that we have as screeners. That's, that's absolutely beyond the science right now. So I agree with that. Uh, maybe before we open up to the public, um, can, um, attaching on to this, uh, so this seems so if I'm now um, in the point or, or taking the perspective of plasticity in a sense, where can we intervene? Or if you are a, a parent now, because the way that you described it, for example, the, the, the predictors that you wanted to, to know about the child in, order, uh, child in order to make predictions were very much kind of um, aspects of the child itself and not so much uh, aspects of the environment in a sense. Um, this is something that parents could potentially change about the environment or change about the, the, their interactions with the child. So it, what would be your best bet in terms of, so how can you actually make a difference as a parent for your, for your child to learn language? So Robert Plowman would say that you can't. <laughs> um, I, I think... I would say we don't know. We do not know how to change the environment to encourage children to learn language. Um, I'm not quite as pessimistic as um, Plowman. I would say that there are, there are some things that probably help, might help, and can't hurt. Talking, you know, playing, reading, talking, all of the, you know, lovely things that, you know, we like doing with our children. Um, you, should, you should be doing all of those things. Providing, with stimulate, providing them with stimulating environments, um, uh, providing them with loads of books, all of these sorts of things. The only thing that worries me slightly is that, um, uh, that we could have a very ang middle-class, Anglo-centric view of what is good for language acquisition. And I think that, um, so if you say to somebody who hates reading or whose experience of, uh, an, a parent whose experience of reading was just being forced to read, Lord of the Flies at school and never have read anything else apart from a Facebook feed in their life, telling them to sit down every day and read with their child, especially if their literacy isn't very high, might actually be asking them too much. So I think you're finding ways in which parents and children can engage in more ways that are family friendly and specific to that family is the way that you should be intervening. But understanding that we really don't know what are the causes of individual difference. I just want to say one thing which has found a really two interesting studies that I think are slightly worrying for um, intervention literature. Um, and they both come from the same lab. There's this brilliant uh, group of people um, with, uh, who are using these long day Lena recordings, um, so where you record 16 hours of the children's input and the child's speech, and then you can analyse their... Very, well, with varied degrees of reliability, you can analyse how much the children vocalise and how much speech the children are hearing. And Elika Bergelson has done a really lovely paper in North American homes, looking at the amount of speech that children hear. And M Midi Kaseas has done a really lovely study in um, the Tsetsal Mayan culture, looking at the amount of speech that children hear. In North American homes, parents speak to their children on average for about 11 minutes per hour. Um, which actually isn't very much child-directed speech per day. But in the Mayan homes, the parents talk to their children on average three minutes per hour. And yet, from, it looks from initial um, analysis of the children's speech that the children's 
developmental trajectory of language is the same in the two cultures, despite the fact that, so one, American babies aren't hearing very much child-directed speech, even in middle-class homes where we, you know, presumably the parents are reading to the kids and doing, cooking with them and everything. It's still only 10 minutes per hour. And two, when you almost, you know, when you take it down to three minutes per hour, it still really doesn't seem to have that much effect on language trajectory. So maybe language isn't as malleable as we might expect. But then again, you know, enjoy your children, play with them, have fun with them. Them. Do what you want to do, but don't feel guilty if you do stick them in front of the telly for a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. Now we're going to open up to the to to the public. Um, we're going to have two microphones um, running around, and maybe you can you can if you have a specific person who you want to address the um, the question to, then please let us know who that is. Yeah. Okay, I had a question to Mike Frank, please. Uh, when you were discussing the inferential processes that the children were going through um, with the hat and glasses, uh, you, you spoke as if it were a very literal uh, exclusive reasoning process, uh, process over something that might look like a Fedorian line of thought. Now, if that's what you think, um, the question how do children learn language needs to be rephrased as how do children relearn or, or learn natural language. And then there might be a deeper question about whether they learn language at all. Now, I suspect that can't be what you think, but could you say more about what you do think, not in the metaphorical terms? Sure, yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, you're right that I was giving a, a kind of a high-level logical gloss to the kind of inference that's happening. Um, but this is really a focus of my lab's work. So um, there are three components to the kind of inference I described. First, the space of meanings. Second, the space of messages. And third, the actual inferential machinery. Uh, so with respect to the space of meanings, I have the least to say. Um, so I've been relying throughout this discussion on the notion of non-linguistic forms of meaning, representations of objects and events. And I don't have an account of that that I'm going to put forward here. Uh, with respect to the space of messages, I think there, you know, a combinatorial space of, of forms is a very reasonable thing to posit here. Uh, the output of some kind of segmentation and chunking processes uh, that are operating over children's input uh, then become the uh, candidates for mapping. Uh, and then the infer inferential processes that operate over those, I have a specific proposal, which is roughly uh, neo-Gricean. That is, it comes out of Paul Grice's idea that communication uh, is inference about cooperative action between uh, conversational participants. Uh, so my particular uh, flavor of this is known as the Rational Speech Act model. It comes out of earlier game theoretic models of communication. Basic idea is if you're playing with me in this game where we both win, it's a cooperative game, we both win if you and I successfully communicate on the meaning, if we coordinate. Uh, then when you choose a message, uh, I get to consider these alternative meanings with respect to the alternative messages that you might have chosen in that case. And you then can choose the message by reasoning about what I will have thought the meaning will be. And so that creates a recursion. In RSA models, specifically, we ground this recursion out in the literal meanings of the utterances. So we have a, what's called a literal listener. And the speaker reasons, what would a literal listener do if I said this? Then the pragmatic listener says, what would a pragmatic speaker have chosen to talk to that literal listener about uh, if they were meaning this? So this. Uh, in, in formal terms, it's a, uh, a probabilistic model, which can operate over known meanings and messages. Now, in recent years, a lot of our effort has been focused on generalizing this to cases where you don't know all of the messages and you don't know how they ground out in a literal semantics. So you can make inferences about the semantics. You can even sometimes make inferences about the meanings and the semantics when these are instantiated in modern neural networks in each case. Um, and then you can uh, kind of layer some really exciting phenomena on top of that. My collaborator, Noah Goodman, has looked at phenomena like linguistic vagueness, uh, figurative language, hyperbole. Um, uh, some of my collaborators have looked at politeness phenomena on top of this. So you really can get a lot of these exciting non-literal phenomena uh, coming out of these uh, interactive components. So this is certainly not a Fodorian account. This is an account that leverages a very rich notion of the uh, computational processes of communicative inference uh, as instantiated in RSA, combined with a library of forms and a non-linguistic library of concepts or meanings. Can you hear me? 
Francis Michel. Yeah. Um, so you've, and I have a question that, that follows up from the, uh, I think, further point that you've just made, and you've both elaborated on how a modeling approach has really sort of accelerated our understanding and given us a lot of insight into language acquisition and how language works. And I'm wondering whether you could elaborate or speculate a little bit on some of the challenges and limitations of that approach. And so one thing that comes to my mind, for example, is how much could that particular approach tell us how humor is acquired? Right? or how irony, or how do we learn irony or sarcasm, right? where there is a certain ambiguity in the input that I'm getting, and I'm making use of that ambiguity to convey a certain type of meaning. So I'm wondering um, whether, for example, that might be something, or other things that might be sort of a challenge or limitation to that approach. Thanks for the question. Yeah, maybe I'll say a little bit about this kind of figurative language first, and then we can both talk broadly about uh, the ways that the modeling approach can and, and cannot uh, inform what we do. So with respect to uh, um, non-literal language, RSA, our, our uh, set of models, has a particular interpretation that I, I find really natural now that I've lived in it for a couple of years. So the idea is um, when I'm reasoning about a speaker, I reason about them as a utility theoretic agent in the sense of an economic agent that has a particular payoff. Now, in the simplest Gricean version of that, your payoff is you get a dollar if we both know what the referent is. That's a pure informational utility, and it's purely cooperative. But there are many ways to modify that utility, and as you modify it, uh, you create uh, cases where you get uh, figurative language or um, the other non-literal formats. So for example, um, in one early paper, Noah and his student Justine Cow. Uh, created a utility function where there's an informational utility and there's also a social utility. I can want to tell you how I'm feeling about something. Uh, in particular, I might want to convey that I'm happy or angry. And so when I say uh, the watch cost $10, you might think, okay, the watch costs $10. The watch costs $100, well, maybe it actually costs $100. Uh, watch costs $1,000, maybe. The tea kettle cost $1,000. Now, I'm actually, it probably costs 25, but I'm angry about how much it cost. So you can get this divergence. So the, the listener listening to this is trying to figure out, well, what, what utilities does this person have and what, are they angry? Well, it seems unlikely that they're really trying to tell me that the tea kettle was $1,000. Maybe they'll clarify that it was, but probably they're using language in a more flexible way to convey something else. And in our work on politeness, we followed up on that. If I say, oh, your poem, well, it wasn't terrible. Um, Maybe it was terrible, but I'm trying to spare your feelings. Maybe I'm trying to be a little bit vague. Maybe I say, well, it had some really nice points. I liked that image. Um, I'm trying to say, well, but the other points, they weren't so nice. Uh, but I'm trying to let you know that I care. I'm not just saying, well, that was a bad poem, which is literally true. So, so in, in all of these ways, uh, adding flexibility into the model formalism with respect to the utilities of the agent and also with respect to the literal semantics, being able to deviate a little bit from those literal messages. Um, those are the ingredients that produce these literal and non-literal uh, readings. Now, maybe this example actually illustrates some of the strengths and weaknesses of the modeling framework. I note I'm saying framework here because what I'm doing is uh, describing a series of exploratory studies where we tried some phenomenon. Uh, it, our model didn't produce appropriate results. We modified the model. We ran more studies. There's this iteration. Um, and in recent years, we've started to realize, OK, we need to stop the modeling at some point and make just pure predictions. We need to put our money on the table and make a bet. Um, and that's a very constraining process. It's an important one because it shows external observers that uh, you know, we, uh, we called a bet and we won it, at least to a certain degree. But it also means we had to stop the iterative process of improving the models. And you know, Manuel and I were just chatting about this, this process the other day. It's always a question, well, do we go back then and fix the models for the other data and re-predict? There's, there's, you know, there's a complex process of um, model building and empirical data collection that, that uh, the faster that loop is, the better the, the science is. But often, you wait years for the technical advance that allows you to make those new predictions. So, so I think there are some limitations, and there are parts of that uh, progressive workflow that we're still working out. So the only thing I would add, and that was a really good description of what modeling does, it, it's just a way of forcing you to be clear about what your theory is saying. So if you have a verbal theory, you can, you know, massage a little bit here or pretend, you know, sort of a hand wave about a little bit here. If you have to build a model that actually implements what you think is going on, then it forces you to be um, really, really, really clear about what you're doing. And we, as studies of language, we can't use mouse models. I can't do what Sonia Werners does and Max Planck and, and study bats and pull bits of their brains apart and see how they work. I can't do that because there isn't another animal species that use language. So if I have to 
um, if I have to create a, a theory of what I think is going on and what the mechanisms are that make predictions that I can then test on experimental data, I have to use computational modeling. Or robotics, actually. iCub is a brilliant robot for testing developmental psychology. Um, so they're just another tool in, in the toolkit for me that makes you specify exactly what your theory says. Um, so you talked about general mechanisms for learning language and specific mechanisms, both of you. But I don't, but then we kind of diverged into animals and other topics. <laughs> and so I want to come back and if you, if you had to teach a class and write, write these on the board, under general mechanisms, would you, what I think I, you're saying is statistical learning, Maybe memory, some, maybe some categorization. But what are the specific mechanisms that each of you think about in terms of learning language and how domain specific are they? What are they? And I'm kind of uh, perplexed by, the, by saying it's in the genes because, you know, Chomsky did that. We moved it all into the genes, okay. But we're developmental psychologists, and we don't study the genes. So it's moving into a different black box. So let's leave that aside and think about, I want to hear what you think the domain-specific mechanisms are and how much they are for language. <laughs> yeah, this is great, right? Because I. <laughs> Because <laughs> we had a we had a dunder session on um, on what we think <laughs> mechanisms of language, so I have a list. <laughs> um, okay, but I, I mean, so I'm, it was a little bit different from that. So it was we were asking the question, what variables contribute to variation in language acquisition? But I think it's the same thing, right? If a variable is causing variation, it must be a language acquisition mechanism. Um, and so what things are important for language? We said st structural or um, structural connectivity in the brain. So, you know, this is a neuroscience place, obviously. But actually, it is really interesting if you look at how um, the language centers in the, of the brain mature and how the development of the connections between them and actually the process of myelin myelinization. Um, this uh, is something that... Uh, occurs earlier in maturation in some areas of the brain, say in the auditory cortex, than in some of the, um, uh, say in Broca's area, for example. And so this is something that, um, so the, the speed with which the brain can build and uh, learn, build connections between neurons, build those synaptic connections, could actually um, have an effect. Um, we also, actually, interestingly, this fact about personality, right, seems to actually affect language learning. So, um, Gert Westerman and his colleagues have an have, have a interesting study that shows that ch shy children don't learn as well in word learning experimental tasks, which is completely bizarre, but that might affect it. But that's, again, a domain general thing. Statistical learning ability we've talked about. Um, uh, categorization ability. So this is the ability to build abstract categories, like say, actually dog is an abstract category because the word dog refers to all of the dogs in the world and cartoon dogs and Scooby-Doo, as well as you know massive dogs and small dogs. So you're actually describing a category. So that so this ca process of categorization um, is probably domain general. So labeling a category is language, but categorization itself is domain general. Um, we debated the role of sociocognitive abilities. So, um, and basically, that you know, that's your central thesis that it's our intention, reading, our ability to communicate that matters. Um, auditory perception matters. We also debated the role of executive function. Right? What role does executive function play in language? Um, executive function is sort of conscious processes, so you know how well you pay attention or how well you can inhibit one response and move to another response. And that doesn't, you wouldn't think that has very much to do with language, which is all effortless and automatic. But actually processing a sentence is, um, is effortful. 
And in order to learn, you have to process a sentence. So, so maybe executive function has, is one of the mechanisms that um, uh, matters. Um, musical ability. So prosody, maybe how well that you can sort of pick up on the prosody of speech, that might help. These are all domain general mechanisms. Um, and the reason for that is that although I sit on the fence, I actually don't think there's a huge lot of evidence for language-specific mechanisms because the ones that we've investigated have tended to be things like language-specific knowledge. So as far as I'm aware, very few people have said, here's a language-specific mechanism that's actually a mechanism. Most people, when they've talked about what is language-specific, have talked about rules like subjacency or uh, principle A or principle B or structure dependency. And I actually am not convinced that those are innate. I think that they probably do emerge out of conceptual cognitive capacities. Um, so... I think there's lots and lots of domain general mechanisms. I think that, as I said before, what differs from us and the animals is kind of abstract and complex thought that we can create. And maybe if you have a category for a language-specific mechanism, I would love to hear it, because I don't rule them out. I just haven't found one I believe in yet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is uh, quite a nice statement. I, I, the way I, I think about this, so I play the guitar, and I sometimes think about um, you know, what aspects of my cognition are guitar-specific. Um, so it, from the perspective of a cognitive scientist, maybe I would find my chording system and my, you know, my soloing system, and I've got the, you know, the uh, specific strumming mechanisms and the you know, specific fingering mechanisms. But you know, from, from, the, from a broader perspective, right, that seems kind of laughable. Um, on the other hand, I don't deny that the pr practice that I've put in has created some pretty specific representational content around the guitar fingerboard and musical theory and harmony and so forth. Uh, so there are representations that are built up uh, by uh, deliberative practice in this particular kind of case. Um, there are also uh, abilities that are certainly more well-developed, my you know, articulation with my right hand or my finger movements with my left hand. And I think language in many ways isn't that different. Uh, it's a deeply skilled expertise that's bent to a critically important uh, adaptive task. And as such, there's expertise and representation that are built up using a holistic set of systems or mechanisms. So um, in many ways, I think, you know, even though the domain specific domain general is, is a, meant to be an inclusive uh, labeling of mechanisms. It's actually one that reflects a presupposition that there is such a thing as kind of domain specificity, as opposed to having systems that are engaged adaptively in different tasks and that build up uh, kind of repertoires and expertise in particular tasks. So uh, I tend to agree that, that there are many different uh, general mechanisms that are leveraged to build expertise and representations that are then language specific in the sense that, uh, you know, I don't typically use my strumming uh, hand for anything else. I can't think of anything that I really would use that particular fine articulation for. Um, that doesn't mean that I couldn't have. It means that I, I didn't and there is no adaptive function that would cause me to bring that expertise uh, to the fore. Mechanism, ah, specificity of mechanism. I wondered about specificity of motivation. So, uh, Mike, particularly you emphasize that children's drive to communicate is an essential feature of language acquisition or the motivation to communicate. And um, I wonder how specifically you mean that. Um, if you oppose it to an alternative, let's say, uh, a, drive, a motivation to connect or a motivation to engage or interact or any of these that are not quite as specific. And I think the reason why it might be worth being precise is because the motivation is one of the things that, that's uh, sort of pulled out when looking for species differences or human ability to acquire language. So I wonder how specific you think of that motivation. Yeah, I think that Manuel has already very reasonably called me out on the, the, uh, um, the need for a spectrum here. Uh, I can't offer that much of one other than to echo what, uh, what Caro has said, which is that presumably we're talking about differences in degree rather than in kind. Uh, so one example that comes to mind, just because I, I know it um, in some depth, is the example of the dog chaser. 
Um, it's a border collie who was taught just a, a, an astonishing number of words by his trainer. And clearly, both the trainer and the dog were deeply motivated by this task, practicing four or five hours every day for a period of years. Now, Chaser exhibits really amazing vocabulary knowledge. Uh, he also, you know, in the, in the thousands of words, recognize there are bins of objects tagged with the name uh, so that the trainer can remember what each object is called. Um, he also uh, demonstrates pretty good mutual exclusivity in word learning, which was one of these kind of hardline phenomena that uh, various theorists have posed. And he also can do some word order decoding, um, although uh, there are some real severe constraints on the decoding that he was able to do. We're talking two to three words in a particular order that worked for him, not that worked for English. Um, but to the point of his motivation, now I think it's clear that there's some motivation there. Uh, is it precisely the motivation that uh, we would identify in children? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think he was interested in communication per se, although I don't really know. I, I doubt, I mean, maybe you want to gloss like barking at a kind of a stranger as uh, trying to signal or share, but I don't think that's really exactly what's going on. But there's certainly a, motiva a motivation to coordinate. Uh, that's happening with, with other species that uh, was the fuel for the, or the engine for that particular accomplishment. Um, it's not typically the engine for dog communication, maybe, uh, or only at a much, much more reduced scale. So I, I think some taxonomy there is needed. Uh, and the part that's going to get especially tricky is where we look at the taxonomy of uh, dis difference and disorder in um, human children versus a uh, kind of a, a, an evolutionary taxonomy where we look at uh, cross species difference. So that, that should be a locus of, of, uh, um, of research, but there are so many other differences that can found, found precisely this variable that we care about. Uh, differences in sequence learning ability and memory and production ability and so forth that these experiments aren't trivial to, to think about even uh, at a theoretical level. Yeah, and I think looking more into language acquisition in children with autism is going to be really useful there because we really know very little apart about language acquisition in autism from the be very beginning. So we know quite a lot about the pragmatic problems that children with autism have, but some children don't develop language. Some children with autism don't. Some children develop language and then stop talking. Uh, so that would be really interesting. But I actually wanted to turn the question back on the questioner and ask what he thinks is the intrinsic motivational difference between animals and human children or whether he has any thoughts on it because human children have a drive to communicate and no other animals have the same drive but what is it what is the difference i uh well i'm glad i'm not on stage uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think uh, that what children bring to this is not the motivation to communicate i don't think it's anywhere that specific um i think there is a, an increased um, motivation and sensitivity to establish social contact of some sort and to engage in social interaction. Um, but I don't think to satisfy that motivation needs to be communication specifically. I think it can be satisfied in other ways. That doesn't mean that it might not have the same knock-on consequences, right? So engaging in communication brings about the kind of satisfaction for that motivation, but I think it is probably more general than that. It does develop, right? Because we know that um, at least, I can't remember what age it is, but at least by 18 months or two years of age, if you respond to children just by smiling and giggling and engaging in social interaction, when they're really trying to communicate something like look behind you at the exciting toy, they get really frustrated. So at some point, children you see children are, hope, are, are using social interaction to communicate rather than just being satisfied with it as social interaction. Surely if they intend to communicate, they'd be frustrated if that intention isn't successful. Um, but I, and it's also possible that their motivation is changing content. I was thinking of some very early origins. Yeah. Uh, I I yeah, so I, I think uh, pushing on this kind of question is precisely where I want to go. And uh, in a, you know, in my first reading of the literature, so, you know, circa 15 years ago, I thought the coolest possibility was that kids, you know, the sort of uh, Tomasello nine month revolution was the beginnings of gathering evidence about the communicative function of language. And the, uh, you would find that early word learning was associative and then uh, 
the communicative use of language was a generalization on that early word learning. Um, and so you would see kind of increasing emergence of communicative signatures of language in the sort of one year to one and a half years range. Now, data are fuzzy. Um, baby science is really hard, but I don't think my version of that, at least the timeline, is tenable anymore. At, at best, the, uh, the discovery of communicative principles needs to be way earlier in infancy uh, to be according with most of our evidence right now. So a couple of pieces of evidence that really shape my thinking about this. Um, one are these Vulamanos type experiments that I alluded to, but that are, are really pretty compelling. So you have somebody who's kind of trapped behind a barrier and is trying to get something, and then uh, so they, they go for a particular object, then they leave for a second. Now we have two objects, the one they wanted and another foil that's been exposed, pre-exposed in another way, and a new person comes on the scene. Uh, and the reacher is reaching, uh, the interlocutor doesn't know which one they want, uh, and then a variety of things, communicative gestures do work, uh, words do work, but coughs and other non-communicative gestures, fists, weird kind of uh, uh, gestures don't work to signal to the interlocutor in the baby's eyes that the, uh, uh, the, the initial communicator wants the object. So there's a recognition then um, in compre comprehension that language is being used to transfer information. And the earliest of these experiments and a simplified version of that is um, between six and nine months. So that, uh, that's out there. There's uh, kind of categorization findings out there that suggest that using words uh, uh, orients kids to the number of objects they are. If they're different words, they're different objects. Um, around nine to 10 months, uh, you get um, arguably even earlier uh, categorization being different when words are used, um, six to nine months. Um, there's one three month paper even. So there, there are a lot of pieces of data that to me suggest that if there is early abstraction happening, it's happening very early. They're really learning about what communication is way earlier than I would have thought it was possible. So uh, one way that I think about this is via a framework that um, Noah Goodman, Tomer Ullman, and others have called the blessing of abstraction. Blessing of abstraction refers to the idea in some computational models that you can be bad at all of the specifics of some uh, particular task, yet learn the general structural regularity that underlies it. That is, you might not know any particular words, but you get that words in general are used to communicate. Uh, so that's the only way that I could think about this uh, in a learning framework that pushes the timeline so early. I'm still kind of interested in that learning account, but uh, it's, not, it's not a gradual emergence anymore. Uh, and it doesn't seem to depend on, um, as a kind of Piagetian account would, the ability to actually act in the world using language. I've got a very general question because there was so much agreement today and uh, this worries me some. Um, and, and even on a bigger scale, I was, uh, I was wondering whether if you look at the latest developments in the, in the Chomsky program, for example, Chomsky, Hauser and Fitch with recursion or then merge, uh, the latest Chomsky inversion, isn't all collapsing into big agreement and isn't this highly compatible with the kinds of stories you want to tell and the big disagreements uh, are a thing of the past? So I hope so. And the reason I hope so isn't because, um, it's because I think science is most effective when you build a specific, you build an explicit theory, you test your explicit theory, you test its predictions, your predictions show that your theory is wrong, and then you write a paper saying that you're wrong. When everybody starts doing that, then we will get somewhere. And I am perfectly happy to write a paper showing that merge exists, or my de no, that's not true. I am happy to write a paper showing that my data supports the predictions of the merge theory. Um, and I will be really, really happy when a Chomskyan writes a paper that um, supports the predictions that maybe merge doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, so I don't see this as consensus as a, as a bad thing. I think what I'm hoping that we have here is evidence-based science. And that's where everybody's moving, I think. Chomsky and um, uh, linguistics as well as developmental psychology. And just as one quick example, um, 
Charles Yang, I don't necessarily agree with his probabilistic theory. He has a, a theory of um, syntax acquisition, which is about probabilistic parameter setting. So very much in the Chomskyan tradition, but he acknowledging that um, the input actually has a bigger effect than just triggering uh, the setting of parameter settings. So he has a really nice sort of very explicit mathematical theory that make predictions. And there are Chomskyans who won't talk to him because he's acknowledged that the input matters more than, than is perhaps allowed in the Chomsky tradition. So that's, um, that's my problem with, with the big debates of the past. And I think it's not consensus, it's just a consensus to accept what the evidence is telling us. That's what I hope. Yeah, the, the consensus about, is about the rules of the game. The specifics, much of, much of what we were in consensus about was what was unknown, um, or what the broad subheadings of the right investigation are. Uh, the details of the models are where this matters. And the fact that we now are in a position to have models that make contact with empirical data is, is uh, at least a, a playing field upon which we can have a good game. You know, the, uh, the kind of pre-paradigmatic discussion of what even is a, you know, the kind of argument that we could have where that, that you know, you could say, well, that, that kind of evidence doesn't, you know, doesn't fit in yet, oh, no, yes, I want to use that kind of evidence. That, that's, that's a very unproductive state for a field to be in. Um, now, the kind of disagreement that I think we, we do reasonably have and, and that's inspiring me to go think about new evidence is about uh, kind of the specific mappings between particular uh, experimental results and the theoretical entities there supposed to, uh, to expose like this, uh, our thematic roles more like a statistical learning experiment or a rule learning experiment. That's a, a neat uh, research question that can be operationalized, that can be brought to bear on uh, some of the computational literature. So that's, I, I don't think that's, uh, you know, there's no rah, rah, we're, we're done here. It's more, um, okay, uh, now we know what to do, more or less. Now, what are the models gonna be that emerge? That's, that's still far, for me, a very open question. On that positive note, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much, Michael Frank, Caroline Rowland. Thank you very much for being here, and I hope to see you all at the reception upstairs. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>